Thank you for joining this episode of our webinar series on best practices in e-discovery and digital forensics. Today's session is focused on the use of data maps and custodian interviews to help locate evidence early in the process and gain leverage for building your best case. This building block in the e-discovery workflow has seen massive changes due to the pandemic and the shifting ESI landscape. And ESI stands for Electronically Stored Information. Identifying sources of evidence has become a significant challenge as new messaging platforms, devices, and evolving social media platforms increase the complexity for all types of matters. My name is Jeff Fugit. I'm the Chief Revenue Officer for Lexby, and I'll be the moderator for today's event. We've got a lot of information to cover, so we'll get started. About our webinars, our webinars take place monthly and cover a variety of relevant e-discovery and digital forensic topics, trends, best practices, and strategies. We've got a limited number of seats, so be sure to register early for those sessions that are of interest to you. If you have technical issues or questions, please email us at webinars at lexby.com and we'll address those right away. Our webinars are available online at lexby.com for viewing via streaming video or downloadable as a PDF presentation or MP3 podcast. You'll find this webinar and a complete listing of other webinars at lexby.com. To be notified of future live and on-demand events, please email us at webinars at lexby.com or follow us on LinkedIn. We're based in Austin, Texas, and we've served almost 8,700 legal professionals with our cloud-based e-discovery platform and forensic services. We've been doing this for more than 16 years. We have the industry's most affordable and full-featured DIY cloud-based e-discovery platform. We have the industry's fastest e-discovery processing and document review platform, which also gives you leverage in the process because you get from document ingestion to review faster, so you've got that time to build your best case. We deliver the industry's fastest return on investment per a study that was done by G2. We are also rated as the e-discovery company that's the easiest to do business with. We have a full forensic lab staffed with Celebrite certified forensic investigators who perform full and targeted forensic collections. We also have a team of experienced e-discovery specialists and expert consultants who are all ACED certified and ready to assist on a moment's notice should you need it. If you'd like a demonstration of our platform or a, a competitive estimate for your next case, simply email us at sales at lexby.com and we'll get that taken care of. Joining us today is Gene Albert. Gene is the co-founder and CEO of Lexby. He is an experienced litigator and e-discovery expert. He is a sought after speaker on e-discovery and legal tech topics. He has a BA and MBA from the University of Texas and a JD from SMU. Before I turn it over to Gene, I'm gonna cover some of the emerging sources of evidentiary ESI, as well as ask for your participation in some polling questions to set the stage for Gene. There is a constant evolution and adoption of evidentiary ESI sources. Voice memos, voice notes, messages, and voice-to-text capabilities have exploded in popularity with relatively little coverage in the media. With over 7 billion voice memos sent over WhatsApp daily, this is a well-established and rapidly growing evidentiary source for many matters. Smartphone capabilities have enabled this messaging modality, which is convenient, can better communicate sentiment, and is very efficient to execute. This capability is supported by a wide range of applications, including productivity apps like Slack, as well as social media platforms. So we're seeing more and more of these voice memos and voice notes in matters. The next source that I wanted to talk about are smart speakers, or smart sources of ESI. Smart sources of ESI are typically driven by a digital assistant like Alexa, Siri, or Google. Smart speakers like the Amazon Echo have grown in popularity. The Echo dominates the smart speaker market and captures 240 seconds of recorded audio with each clip. Virtually every smartphone has the smart speaker capability and modern TVs are often equipped with this capability as well. These digital assistants are always listening and if you have one of these devices in your office, you want, might want to double check the settings to ensure your privacy. 
We've seen evidence from smart speakers used in a bunch of cases recently, so it's becoming uh, definitely a more prevalent source of ESI in litigation. Other sources of ESI, there are a myriad of other sources that could be relevant to your cases. These include digital security cameras, wearables that capture location and the physical fitness of an individual, location capturing apps and devices like smartphones, IoT or Internet of Things sensors that can capture the location and status data, drones, and then virtual reality. So the metaverse, it'll be interesting to see what impact that has. We haven't seen many cases with avatars in virtual worlds, but it is just a matter of time before we see virtual reality evidence in cases. So what are the implications for your cases? Well, custodian data mapping is essential if you're going to gain access to the evidentiary files needed for your case, including those emerging sources of VSI. Gene will be going into this in detail, so I'm looking forward to hearing that. Being able to forensically collect data from all of the ESI sources is critical. You have to process a greater breadth and depth of file types in eDiscovery, and your eDiscovery platform needs to be able to handle the variety of file types. Video and audio files need to be transcribed and searchable. Lastly, many evidentiary conversations are now crossing communication modalities from email to voice notes to Slack to other messaging applications. And so being able to identify that and make sure that you're reviewing all those relevant documents uh, is absolutely critical. And with that, I'll ask for your participation in our first polling question. Our first polling question is, have you used a voice memo or voice note as a source of evidence in a case? While you're answering that, I'd like to thank you for participating in our polling questions today. All right, I'll go ahead and close that poll. And our next polling question, do you consider the emerging sources of ESI as a challenge to your cases? All right, there are a couple more answers coming in. I'll go ahead and close that poll. Again, thank you for participating in our polling questions today. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to Gene Albert. Gene? Hi, I'm Gene Albert, CEO of Lexby, and welcome to our discussion today on custodian interviews and data mapping. Uh, this is a very pragmatic subject, and we're going to talk about discovery workflow and case development, uh, custodians why interview them, how to do them, forms, etc. Benefits of the, and then data mapping, how does that tie in with custodians? Uh, benefits of it, uh, reports, logging, how to integrate that into your e discovery system, and then conclude on some takeaways. We will have copies of this uh, webinar and recording, and also the forms referenced in here will be available for uh, participants. The uh, next slide here uh, goes over the e-discovery workflow, and this uh, shows up in the blue the main stages of the case, and then down in orange are, are various uh, subparts or tasks that are done or functions. The main things we'll be talking about here will be custodian identification on the left and data mapping as part of the setup and planning. This goes into collection as well. We have other webinars that uh, cover these other subjects if you're interested in any of these things specifically. The first question we should address is just how do you identify custodians? What are what are they? This isn't um, very well defined in um, or consistently defined in, in case law and rules particularly. And a lot of this has grown up through uh, discovery practice. So first, uh, who are custodians? These are individuals who possess uh, data or electronically stored information, ESI, documents that are potentially relevant to the case and uh, from whom uh, data should be collected. These are people that have knowledge of facts related to the, the uh, litigation or dispute. There are several types of custodians we refer to. One is uh, key custodians. These are the individual parties of the deponents, witnesses, subpoena subjects. These are you know, individuals that have 
relevant knowledge and documents about the uh, case or dispute matter. The second are departmental custodians. These are individuals who are uh, responsible for the departments and documents in them, even though they may not have personal knowledge of the specific document in question. So the HR department will have, may have a, in larger companies may have a custodian in charge of HR doc, doc, documents that would uh, respond to a subpoena and or a request for, um, for collection of documents and be the um, custodian for those documents. There's also the concept of representative custodians. In larger cases, it may be impractical to collect the data from everyone of a class and, and to, to develop whatever the theory of the case is or to get a, a representative data, one or more representative custodians might be selected. So if a large company had 100 salespeople and there was some issue having to do with the salespeople, uh, a, a one or, or several salespeople might be identified and then, and then they would be representative custodian for the class of the person, even whether it's a class action or not, but for the, uh, the, gr the group of uh, individuals for collecting data from them to develop the theory. Another thing I want to mention is the idea of, of, of shares. So sometimes some some data, there really isn't anybody who had control of it particularly. This could be a network drive or a cloud drive for individuals or, or department or a company in general. And sometimes data will be collected from those shared drives or shared repositories and um, the custodian will be identified as a share for those pur for that purposes. I want to give an example of email that, that I think illustrates well what, what the custodian concept really is. So um, uh, imagine a January 119 email from Bob to Sally and this is represented by an Outlook MSG file, uh, that being uh, MSG being the file format that uh, Microsoft Outlook keeps emails in and that includes both the email body, metadata, and the attachments and it's represented by a single MSG file that can be uh, taken out of Out Outlook and copied uh, individually. Um, this MSG was in Bob, um, as you'd expect, but and also Jim's possession, who wasn't a part of the email, but not Sally. So in this instance, you have um, an, an email going from Bob to Sally. Bob has it, Sally doesn't anymore, and Jim does. So why does Sally not have it? Well, it could be deleted, um, you know, any number, number of reasons. Maybe it wasn't delivered to her. Why does Jim have it when he wasn't a party to it? Who knows? That, that could be developed. But in this case, Bob and Jim would be the custodians for the data, and Sally would not be. People often think that the sender and receiver are automatically custodians of data, but that's not the email. That's, that's not the case. The custodian is a, a possession um, concept and it's orthogonal to whether somebody sent or received, although it's highly, highly related or correlated, of course, in most cases. Uh, next slide, we'll talk about why uh, interview custodians. Lots of good reasons to do it. Uh, locate the relevant uh, ESI. You build your preservation obligations and legal hold obligations from the custodians to meet the Zubalaki requirements or obligations. Um, I'll talk about that in the next slide. And another reason is to address, uh, have somebody talk to the custodians early on and, and address possible anxiety. Many people, when they receive a legal hold notice, if they're not used to it, can become very anxious about it and can spin. So it's an opportunity to you know, talk to them, control the narrative, uh, explain the process, answer their questions early on. Another uh, key reason is to gather facts and do your initial case assessment. As uh, cases have gotten larger and larger, it's, it's harder and harder to understand all the key documents early on in the case and more and more dangerous to wait as the case develops. So uh, anything one can do early on to start building one's narrative, one's story, uh, do timelining and have a consistent theory of case early is very important. And that can be done very well with, with custodian, early custodian interviews. From the custodians, if done properly, you'll identify the, the data stores and, and allow for data mapping of the available ESI in the case. And we'll talk about that later, so I won't address it here. Uh, prepare for collection of uh, the ESI. A plan ahead for discovery obligations. Uh, how long is it going to take? How many custodians? Uh, what, what can be committed to? What's it going to cost? 
all these can be fleshed out with the beginning stages of good custodian interviews and uh, prepare for meet and confer and other um, other discovery obligations as once fund goes in. So um, I put this all under the um, the general category of guy go garbage in garbage out. As you're building up your case, if you don't do a good job at this on the front end with a complex case, it's going to be very difficult to go back and and get to the same level. Uh, otherwise, if you try to try to pick it up at a later time. The next uh, slide will talk about the Zubalenki obligations, a very famous series of cases that are the basis for modern e-discovery law, certainly at the federal level and a lot of state levels, and has been it, the uh, the ideas have been uh, integrated into uh, the rules. Uh, but it's good to go back and read the original case and understand where it was coming from and what the reason was. From the Zubalenki obligations, we get the um, the, the litigation hold um, when the duty arises, when it, you know, litigation is reasonably anticipated, that holds should be issued, um, obligation to interview uh, data custodians, um, et cetera. The basis for this is, is the attorney's obligation to the court. And, and in Zubo Aiki, the court was saying that it's not possible for the attorney to to um, disclaim any of this not being done done properly, and that it's, there's an affirmative duty on the attorney to make sure that this happens. So that was um, um, the thinking of that, and that's carried over to today. Uh, all of the, all of these uh, Zubalenki obligations, discovery obligations, are, are difficult or impossible to do well if the custodian's case participants aren't uh, adequately identified and um, and data interviewed in, interviews from them early in the process. Uh, so, what, what are the downsides? Uh, the next slide of not interviewing early and completely. Um, I think we talked about most of these before. Um, conflicts in, in, can come up later. You may not identify that you had a conflict, and that can come up with early, early custodian um, interviews and really understanding who all the parties are and what the relations are. And uh, that can help give one more time to, to mitigate any conflict issues that have uh, come up through waivers or, or whatever. Um, also, the, the errors and depots not caused by time lining. What, what I mean there is that it helps you develop your theory of case early on and, and, um, and mitigates uh, getting into one's depots and having to change theory of case, which is always um, a problem and can allow you not to be able to develop the evidence and have a consistent theory as you come out of discovery. Why is this done poorly sometimes? Well, a, a lot of reasons. Uh, one is with larger cases, there's more electronically stored information, more documents, and there's just more to do there. Uh, the cases can be more complicated with uh, many, many case participants and potential custodians. Uh, there could be international custodians, and that can raise a, a number of issues of, of how to uh, effectively interview them and uh, get um, do, do one's preservation and collection. If there's ever a change in case representation, uh, this can be an issue too, that um, some of this can just fall between the cracks if it happens early in the case, or it may have been done improperly uh, or with a prior counsel, and the subsequent counsel has to go back and try to backfill and, and handle things that uh, could have been done earlier. Uh, improper delegation to persons uh, that are not uh, adequately trained or have the skills to be able to do the custodian interviews. And just not having a good system, even with with um, competent people, if you're not using checklists and good forms and a system, it's easy to make make mistakes and um, have things uh, fall between the cracks. Next, let's jump into the custodian interview forms. I'll go through these uh, pretty pretty quickly because uh, we we've uh, got these at the end that you can download them if you want to, but just go over the type of information. So one, one would be a record of custodians form where you would start to put together just who are the custodians who you think have information, and this would go into data mapping. Uh, as usual, we use the uh, Enron data because that's uh, publicly available in a complex commercial case. Doing things like uh, the, the range of the events, the, when the hold was issued, et cetera. This ties into uh, what we have in the platform that would be the, the Cast, you could call the cast of character. So, so we start to try to flesh out the relationships between the individuals and the entities here that are involved. 
in some litigations, this is very simple, but in, in some litigation, it, it's exceedingly complex and half the job of understanding the case is just, just teasing out the different relationships between all the parties and entities, et cetera. So having a system that's starting to put this together, identify who they are, and then tie that back into the documents in your fact timelining is uh, very important. What approaches can one take to custodian interviews? Well, there are, there are several. Uh, one is more of a conversational approach. So these would be one-on-one -on -one meetings, uh, last for a lot of uh, reassurance and questions and clarity, information gathering. The disadvantage of it, you know, is that it can just be very time consuming for large organizations and you might have inconsistency in approach between how it was handled. Another is a, is more of a formalized uh, approach where, um, where it, it's off of a checklist or a specific questionnaire, uh, but uh, it's, it's done, um, uh, it, it, it's uh, interviewer driven. Um, sort of a highly defensible uh, way of doing it, um, but um, can be too formal and require modification on the fly to sort of fall out, whatever comes up from the interview, of course. Um, third approach is a survey approach where the uh, custodians would fill out a form without a dialogue, um, much faster, much easier to do without uh, sit down interviews. Uh, and it's um, certainly more cost effective to trade off as it's in, impartial and, and um, it should be followed up on to make sure that uh, the information uh, that it was, was gotten properly and that there was, and it misses out on the opportunity for a one on one interaction, et cetera. And any given uh, case could have a, a, a combination of these approaches for different custodians, of course. Next, let's get into a custodian interview form. Our suggestion is that whenever possible, that the uh, an, an actual interview be done on in person or on form by a knowledgeable interviewer and then the information filled into a form rather than sending it out to the custodian themselves on it and this form is set up with that that, that assumption in mind uh, so this would be a per custodian uh, form um, start off with uh, you know relevant information uh, if the hold when the hold is issued etc uh, the next uh, slide would get uh, there's you know background from the uh, custodian to uh, understand where, where their where their role, if they had inherited any files, or if it was well prepared for them, what their job was, etc. And next would be email information. Um, it, it's amazing how many emails people have. Uh, you know, even in business relations, some companies are very strict about custodians uh, only using their company email address or addresses for uh, communications. But in others, there's a lot of overlap between um, uh, company and individual emails and, and that should be ferreted out and then collections may need to be done from individual email accounts if that's uh, the case that there's potential responsive information there. Uh, location of files, so this is used to uh, build up uh, the uh, data stores, um, how many people have a lot of different devices, um, what, um, uh, what, how many computers they're using, are they using portable drives, do they have information at home, to the cloud, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this next slide is uh, showing more of that, uh, all the, you know, many of the different places where data could be uh, could be stored. Uh, recently, more and more companies are going to cloud, so, so often companies will have one or more cloud places that employees are keeping information now. Next slide uh, talks about social media was uh, company information used in either a company sponsored or other IM or uh, social media accounts of, of any type. So the main ones are identified there. I should ask if any uh, potential information is there where a collection might need to be done. Uh, one of the questions talked about shares, um, personal folders, uh, has any of this been moved, external drives, flash, etc. cetera. Uh, next slide on voicemails, calendar entries, an open question of, of any other information that could be helpful names of contacts and other people that might know about the case that's going back to just developing out your cast of characters and where the data might be. At the end of the custodian interview form, uh, this includes uh, some cautions to the, um, to the custodian uh, not to delete or destroy anything. This could be a reinforcement of the hold and the seriousness of this, uh, making sure that we get everything in. And then lastly, on our form, we've got a place for the interviewer to identify uh, who uh, he or she is. And that could be could be the attorney, could be somebody on the attorney staff, could be somebody on the e-discovery provider staff or somebody else who's brought in to do the interviews under 
the direction of the attorney. And then this, this form would be signed by the interviewer and would show, it would serve as evidence that a, a proper attempt of getting a, a custodian information was done and uh, should be good evidence for the attorney meeting uh, his or her Zubalinki obligations and uh, as that's codified in various uh, e-discovery rules in federal and state courts. The form you're just the forms you're just looking at are available on our website and our help. So you can um, give you instructions on how to go over there and uh, get to our help section and download the form. The form it's on a help page, and then you can see the form is uh, on the bottom of the page that you can you can download. Uh, next, let's turn and talk about data mapping. This flows as the next step to do after or, or concurrent with doing the custodian interviews. So the uh, the data mapping is a an organized map of data sources for legal purposes to be able to identify how many legal stores do the custodians have. They will almost always have multiple, sometimes many, many, many different data stores. What type and how much data is in these data stores, and um, has has that been preserved? And this will come out in a series of different different reports. And this is used as the basis for the rest of discovery to determine what there is to discover and, and how, to, uh, how to how to preserve and collect it. This um, should be done, of course, for uh, one's own side of the case and, one's, and the custodians under one's uh, control. But uh, it, it uh, can and, and perhaps many times should be done as best as possible for opposition, getting uh, a, a data map, even if it's tentative and there's a lot of holes in it, helps uh, of the uh, opposition helps on understanding where their data is and who what you should be asking and who's doing what and and, and have uh, preservation and collection obligations been, been met. It's very ad hoc to do it without some systemized way of building up what um, what what data they have. Um, this can be do, um, attempted to be gotten once one's in in um, depositions of course but if you wait till that long and uh, proper uh, preservation wasn't done then you, you might have a complaint for that 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 might be uh, listened to but uh, the, the data might might be lost if it wasn't preserved and collected properly so that could end up hurting the case if uh, uh, not enough comes out of the sanctions i want to talk first about what data mapping is not if, if you go to a client and ask for a data map or you try to build this up and you talk to IT people, they'll think in terms of a network map, uh, which will be uh, just a connection of all the computers is often done with uh, with the tools that are built into the, the network work analyzers or it could be done ad hoc in uh, uh, Visio or PowerPoint or a number of different tools. So you'll see something like this and uh, it can take a while to get some of this. So, so these are, are, uh, are kept up to date. Um, not very often, so uh, they may have to go back and develop it. So you can lose a lot of time trying to get this out of the client and end up with something that looks like this, but that is practically useless for purposes of having a legal data map that I'm talking about in this webinar. Uh, benefits of data mapping, um, number of ones other than what we've talked about before, um, the risk of missing data sources uh, that uh, you could have gotten to with, uh, with proper interviewing and data mapping. Certainly, budgeting for understanding how much discovery is going to, how much, you know, the, the discovery costs are very much related to the amount of uh, the number of people and the amount of, of uh, data being collected, number of data sources, and will scale pretty linearly with that. So, understanding how much data there is, how many people, how many stores uh, goes a long way on, on allowing you to budget out your e discovery and not have unhappy surprises about it. And, and also, um, uh, you know, helping you with your, your timing of collection of being able to collect as needed um, at various commitments that you've made to as part of the case. This, uh, I'm going to jump into uh, tools that we've developed here. There's other data mapping tools out there, but uh, we use, use ours, for example, but uh, you have the general ideas of this and this could be developed themselves. We have tools for it. There's other ones out there, uh, but uh, the, the general function should be done in, in all, you know, consistently in all of this. So uh, first there'll be a data mapping log. And let me walk through this in a little bit more detail than I've done on some of these other slides. First off, you'd have the custodian 
uh, in the organization and department they're in there and information about them. And you'll see that they're, they're repeated. So Bob Smith repeated three times on this. This is because Bob Smith has three different data sources associated with him. So if you go to one of the, the far right columns there, you'll see um, that he has uh, Alec email, text messaging on an iPhone, and LinkedIn messages, all, all relevant to this case. And then there's an estimation of the, uh, the number of gigabytes in each one of those that's um, helpful in, in getting a budget if needed. Then um, whether this has been confirmed or it's just estimated here on the, on the data, if it's been looked at yet. Um, and then there's the, the, you see a breakout of the record in between where this would be, uh, this, this would be entered. So you would go through and set this up in each custodian, developing out of the, the, the custodian interviews, there would be a question to the custodian of how many data stores he or she has. Could be one or two, could be a dozen. Um, could include cloud in any of the sources that are out there. Skype, they would all be individual data sources. And these, these would be mapped out on a record by record, row by row basis uh, in a form as, as, I have, as we have here. And then um, you could get the, the, the status of, um, of uh, if it's been uh, confirmed, collected, and then, uh, then you can build your reports out of that. And then the next slide shows some of the reports that could be gotten out of that once it's set up. So, so once you've, you've done all that, that collection, then you can start rolling these up with pivot tables and charts, et cetera, to sort of see how, to see just how much is out there. So you can uh, see the uh, uh, gigabytes per custodian. You can see the, you know, by, by data source, how much are you getting, you know, going across custodian, uh, how much has been collected, how much is uh, confirmed, how much is unknown at this point, and then grass going going off all of that. This uh, helps on your case be able to, be able to show that you, you've done an adequate job of collection. Um, holes, holes in the collection will uh, will pop up when you do this. You'll, you'll, you'll just see anomalies between what you would expect. One custodian has hardly any information. Uh, somebody similar situation has a lot. Uh, there can be reports by date range, and you can see there might have been holes from changing over data systems or, or other for whatever reason that there were problems in collection. So this is a good quality control system, being able to go through on your collections and make sure that you can be reasonably comfortable that you you put out holes, preservations, and collected all the data that you ought to collect, and then uh, be able to defend it if there's any any question that it wasn't done properly. Even if it wasn't done done completely perfectly, that's not the goal. The goal is to do it defensively uh, because perfection just isn't going to be possible in this, this sort of thing uh, because it's too complicated and there's too many externalities. So one can show that that a good faith effort has been done to defensively collect all the, identify and collect all the information. And a system like this can go a long way on, on defending any criticisms that, that uh, one could have of their own uh, identification, preservation, and collection efforts. Flipping that over to the other side, uh, this can be something like this can be built up for opposition and can start to show the holes on, on how data has been collected on opposition's point, and if they've done a, uh, a sloppy or or uh, or uh, intentionally bad effort to collect and to hide information, it can start uh, popping off the screen here on these reports, where you can see what's been collected by date, what's been uh, collected by custodian, what's been collected by data type, and this is the sort of evidence that a judge wants to see to be able to issue sanctions and, and allow for additional discovery to see that uh, one's uh, complaints about opposition's production is not merely um, some, something that's uh, made up or, or a, a fishing expedition, but there's a lot of meat behind the complaint. So these sort of reports go a long way on, on proving up your efforts to get additional discovery or criticize the discovery of, of opposition when it's been done inadequately. Uh, this next slide shows that the information can be tied in with your e-discovery platform. So, so here, the this uh, data mapping log is being uploaded into our platform, LEP, which is the e-discovery platform, and the information about custodian and the data and stuff can be brought into the system, so you can access it consistently with your um, e-discovery platform. If that um, that's helpful, which uh, I think it often often is for developing timelining and other other things that are being done as part of discovery. Um, next, uh, and finishing up, uh, we're going to do a recap on 
data mapping, uh, why would you want to do that? <clears throat> uh, first is to identify potential data sources uh, found through custodian interviews, visualize the data statistics that come out. Um, it's helpful for planning and budgeting, timelining, and then it can be integrated into whatever discovery platform you're using as well, along with some of the other things we talked about. Uh, you can find more about this on our website. Again, this is uh, discussed in our help with examples, and uh, there are instructions on how to go to our website and find uh, data mapping information that we have that ties in with this, um, this webinar and discussion. Uh, and now I'm ready to finish up here and just uh, do a summary and takeaways on the uh, whys and hows of effective uh, custodian interviews and ESI data mapping takeaways. Um, big picture, you have, have a systematic plan of attack, what you're going to do. Uh, do it early and have uh, resources to update it as needed. Uh, this stuff can seem mundane, but it's, it's actually you know, very, very strategic you know, on, on a number, number of ways, so it, it should be done. And the, and the people doing it should have their idea on, on the strategic goals and values of case development and overall budgeting and um, uh, getting the information one needs for their case. Uh, use forms and checklists, ours or somebody else's or your, uh, ones of your own making. But this is very difficult to do if it's done on an ad hoc basis. Um, don't improperly delegate. People doing this need to be experienced. They need to be trained uh, and to, to do it properly. And a lot of mistakes can be done even with well-intentioned people. Lastly, it helps us watch out for the unknown unknowns. This is a famous quote from Department of Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld. Uh, in 2002, I'll do a, a short version of his quote. He said there were um, um, there are the known knowns, the things we know. There are the known unknowns. Those are the things, some of the things we do not know, but we know we don't know them. And there are the unknown unknowns. They're the ones that uh, we don't know we don't know. And those are the ones that tend to be uh, difficult and dangerous. I, uh, taking this over to uh, e-discovery, I think the uh, unknown unknowns are the problems that uh, often bite people in in large, complex e-discovery and that effective um, custodial identification, interviewing, and data mapping can go a long way on ferreting out the sort of things that could be unknown unknowns and identifying and eliminating them through the process. So uh, that's it for today. Uh, thanks for attending. Thanks, Gene. That was a great presentation. At Lexby, we provide comprehensive remote and on-site forensic collections that are fully defensible. We utilize industry-leading tools like Celebrite and Magnet. We handle a wide variety of device and account types, as you can see on this partial list. And we do so at a very affordable rate. And now I'd like to ask our next polling question. Do you have a forensic collection project, and would you like a complimentary consult? All right, I'll go ahead and close that poll. With Lexby's eDiscovery platform hosted at Amazon Web Services, you get on-demand capabilities that scale to address the needs of your case. With Lexby's cloud infrastructure, you can get from document ingestion to review faster and get your productions out the door faster. All of your remote or mobile connected employees can access the Lexby eDiscovery platform via web browser. It works great on Macs, PCs, iPhones, and Android devices. On this slide, I wanted to point out that Lexby is a single end-to-end eDiscovery -end e platform. Unlike many eDiscovery providers, you don't have to move your data from one solution to another. Lexby has fully integrated processing, review, analytics, case timelining, artificial intelligence algorithms, and production capabilities. Keeping your data in an end-to-end eDiscovery -end e platform like Lexby helps eliminate the risk of errors from moving data between platforms, as well as eliminates the cost of what we, what's often called promoting data from one platform to the next. And I'll touch on that here in a little bit. And you can do it yourself and don't have to use expensive eDiscovery project managers. Lexby utilizes AI and machine learning algorithms for several uses that Gene touched on. This includes transcription, that's great for all of those web conferences that happened during the pandemic, language detection and translation for those cross-border matters, sentiment analysis, cognitive image recognition, entity identification, and more. 
These algorithms are tuned to perform these tasks and enable boutique firms to handle document intensive cases with limited staff. The LexBE Discovery platform also has features like advanced email threading and auto redaction to help streamline the review process and ensure you're protecting your client's privacy. Now I'm going to talk to you about eDiscovery pricing. The purpose of eDiscovery technology should be to improve your document review capabilities while driving efficiencies in both time and cost. Unfortunately, there are still a lot of eDiscovery providers that don't pass on the cost savings that technology delivers. We host the LexB eDiscovery platform in the Amazon Web Services Cloud. Our processing, storage, and networking capabilities are not only highly advanced, but they're also incredibly cost-effective, and we do pass the savings on to customers. Here's an example of how we compare to a Relativity reseller. In this comparison, you'll see that the Relativity reseller charges $30 per gig for data ingestion. Our highly efficient processing servers and serverless architecture enable us to offer this for free. While the concept of promotion might sound good, this is usually a cost associated with moving data from one platform to another. The LexBE Discovery platform is an end-to-end -end platform and doesn't require that you move your data. Not only does this save you $125 per gig in this case, but it also helps eliminate data handling errors and eliminates costly project management fees. We also don't charge user fees, so you can have as many users as you need at no additional cost. Relativity recently eliminated their user fees, so we'll see how that impacts the reseller community. We also have seven different user permission levels to help keep your data secure. We don't nickel and dime you either with OCR or electronic endorsement fees per page. We also have highly advanced analytics integrated into the platform at no additional cost, and we're able to deliver savings on the hosting cost too. Here are some samples of how we help solve critical e-discovery issues. Page Tech at Thompson Co. needed Lexby Speed to get some productions out the door to meet deadlines. Lexby is lightning fast and gets you from document ingestion to productions in record time. David Jones was concerned that he would be outgunned by his AMLA opposition. He quickly realized that Lexby was a great equalizer and helped him build his best case that delivered a winning verdict. And with that, I'll ask our last polling question. Would you like a demo of the Lexby eDiscovery platform? While you're answering that, I'd like to thank you for attending today's session. We'll be making the following available to webinar attendees, a recorded streaming version, an MP3 podcast, as well as a PDF. Let us know if you have any questions or comments about this webinar or suggestions for future topics. This webinar is part of the LexBE eDiscovery webinar series. For notices of future live and on-demand webinars as part of the series, email us at webinars at lexby.com or follow us on LinkedIn. Also, we'd like your advice regarding our webinar series. Please complete the survey at the end of today's session. It helps us continuously improve this program and cover the digital forensic and e-discovery topics that are most important to you. I'd like to thank Gene for presenting today and thank you for attending. Watch your inbox for an invite to our next webinar on best practices in e-discovery. Take care.